What is something you haven't been overcoming? Something you haven't been winning over? Go back for a rematch. The fact that you are here shows you are an overcomer. I pray that we are not tired from hearing the word of God, are we? You know, too many lessons, too much preaching, can't handle it. Well, I'm excited to preach the word to you tonight. Thank you so much to my partner in the faith, Michael Williamson, for giving me the privilege. Also, a very special thank you to uh, Kip for helping almost all of the Stockholm disciples come to the EMC to be part of it. We are very grateful, bro. Super appreciate it. And personally, I have a great respect for both Michael and Kip for really being role models. Because that is what this day and age needs. It needs role models. Men whose lives are worthy of imitation. The title I have been given tonight is The Kingdom Dream. And we are going to be focusing on Daniel chapter 2. The Kingdom Dream. The book of Daniel has the second highest number of the word dream being used in it after the book of Genesis. 29 times in the book of Daniel. The word vision appears in Daniel 30 times, more than any other book in the Bible. So it is a book of dreams, it is a book of visions. Do we have any dreamers, do we have any visionaries among us here tonight? I pray that EMC has stirred some visions and some dreams in your heart. That God has put things on your heart for you to live out, for you to change, for you to do. Daniel is recorded as serving under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia, chapters 1 to 4, King Belshazzar of Babylonia, Daniel chapters 5, 7, and 8, King Darius the Mede, Daniel chapters 6 and 9, and King Cyrus of Persia, chapters 10 to 12. Daniel 2, let us go to verse 31. My first point today is the kingdom dream is built on crushed dreams. The kingdom dream is built on crushed dreams. Daniel 2 verse 31. And it says, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue. An enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. So if you didn't know why we say awesome so much, it's because it's in a Bible, amen. We are a Bible church. Awesome in appearance. Verse 32. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While we were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like shaft on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So let me break this down for you really quickly. <laughs> so the dream was about four world powers and the coming of God's kingdom. Now, it is pretty powerful that God made the world powers just like the human body, which might seem like a coincidence, but of course, you don't believe in coincidence if you're a Christian, amen? So we know that the Babylon, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, he was the golden head. Now the issue was, he got a big head. That maybe some of us here tonight. 
So he thought he, thought he was the most amazing thing on the face of the planet. So he built a golden statue in Daniel 3. Although it was only supposed to be the golden head. Meaning he got super prideful. So God had to humble him. God took his mind. Lived like a wild animal in the wild. So you don't want to imitate that, amen? As they say in South London, none of that. Don't do that. And then in the statue you had two arms, right? Which is Media and Persia. Now, two arms, two kingdoms, coincidence? I don't think so. Of course, one of your hands is the dominant hand because one of the kingdoms was the dominant one, which was the Persian kingdom. I know you already saw that, but I wanted to mention that anyway. So as for media, you had Darius the Meat. Some historians say he was a mythical figure. Now, they think that because they don't read their Bibles. Of course, Darius was the throne name of King Cyaxares II, as described by the Greek historian Xenophon, which also was a standard interpretation from Josephus and Jerome. So that makes the account of the historian Herodotus inaccurate, and the Bible is right once more. Now, King Darius and King Cyrus, they shared power. Sharing is caring, amen? So King Darius, he was officially recognized as the highest power in the realm, though Cyrus had the actual power. So Darius died of natural causes within two years after the fall of Babylon. Now, Cyrus had married the daughter of Darius, congratulations, so it made sense for things to be united. So after the passing of Darius, King Cyrus, he unified the whole realm into a single throne. So he had the Medo-Persian Empire. And then, of course, came bronze, that is, Alexander the Great. And he built a huge empire in only four years. That's a pretty good pace when you want to advance the kingdom, amen? But God took him out at the height of his power. And the kingdom was divided amongst his four generals, Ptolemy I of Egypt and Palestine, Seleucus of pa Babylonia and Syria, Lysimachus of Asia Minor, and Antipater of Macedon and Greece. And then, of course, you had the two legs. So what do you do with the legs? You do splits. Now, it hurts to do splits. So the Roman Empire splits. Ouch. East Rome and West Rome. And of course, you don't want to be doing that in your walk with God, making splits. One foot in the kingdom, one in the world. Because you're going to be all in one way or the other. And then, of course, the rock came. Now, there wasn't Dwayne Johnson the rock. It was Christ the rock. So it came. Boom. Destroyed the whole statue. Set up his eternal kingdom that will fill the whole earth and will never be destroyed. This was the dream. It was an awesome dream. So really, what is the kingdom dream? It is that the kingdom of God, it will come. And it will fill the whole earth. World evangelism. You see, God's dream has always been the same. As Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go! And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what is the kingdom dream about? It is about world evangelism. So tonight, are you dreaming the kingdom dream? Are you dreaming about world evangelism? Is this your dream? Not anybody else's dream, but your personal dream, your personal calling from Jesus Christ. We as the Stockholm Mission team, we are dreaming the kingdom dream. And we are excited to take the gospel to Northern Europe. The logo for our Stockholm ICC is a Viking ship. Now, what are Vikings known for? Plundering. You may not have thought it's a Christian concept. Christians, are we going to be plundering? Well, of course, you have in the Old Testament, they plundered the Egyptians. 
to get the riches into the kingdom. But even more importantly, in the New Testament, it says that we are to plunder the strong man's house. Now, who is the strong man? That is Satan. And we go into his house and we take out his possessions, which are people's souls. Every single baptism is a miracle of God. Because we rope the souls from Satan. We are there to plunder Satan's kingdom. And for the Vikings, really, it was a matter of prestige. To be able to go to faraway lands. Sometimes to trade, sometimes to plunder, sometimes both, sometimes to establish settlements. They even got to Paris, and they were recorded that Paris had to give them 7,000 silver coins for the Vikings not to attack them. So they had an interesting situation in Paris. They even found some Arabic coins amongst the loot. That shows how far the Vikings reached. They sailed as far as the Black Sea. They went into the rivers towards Russia. They got to Kiev. They made it all the way to Iceland, to Greenland, and even to America. And they would acquire items that others would not have, and that's where the prestige comes from. Because those things were special. They were unique. And I pray that tonight you see it as prestige, to reach the faraway lands, to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. Why did they do it? Because they had a dream of a better life. And they were willing to leave behind everything, leave behind the safety, their homes, to make the dreams into a reality. You know, our chant for the Stockholm Mission team is Bold, not cold. <laughs> bold, not cold. Bold, not cold. Bold, not cold. Amen. That is our chant. Because you don't want cold commitment. You don't want cold fellowship. You don't want cold preaching. You don't want a cold bedroom if you're married. And the married say... So Sweden is cold. But we cannot be called, we got to be bold. To build a bold church. To build a church that goes against the culture, a countercultural church in Sweden and all of Scandinavia. You see, Nebuchadnezzar didn't just have any dream, he had the dream. He had the kingdom dream. What is the only thing that didn't get destroyed in the dream? It was the kingdom of God. All the other kingdoms, they were smashed to pieces. And they were swept away. So at the end, what remains? The kingdom of God. You see, there is the kingdom of God, and there is nothing else. When we build God's kingdom, it is built on broken dreams. Why are they broken? Because you personally decided to crush them. You decided to crush your dreams so that you could have the kingdom dream. And you will need to have your worldly dreams crushed for you to live out the kingdom dream. What dreams do you have to crush in your life? The dream of who you're going to marry? Maybe God says, you're a white brother, you need an African sister. Maybe God says, okay, you're a black brother, you're trying to find an African sister, you need an Asian sister. Because God knows what you need. God has a dream for you. The dream of where you're going to live. Maybe you want to have this nice cottage in the middle of nowhere, away from people. God says, no, you're going to be living in London. Where people are bumping into you, stepping on your feet. They don't apologize. The old ladies get mad at you. Welcome to London. 
That's what you need in a life. The question is, what dream are you dreaming? Are you dreaming the American dream? Which really is the dream of greed? Are you dreaming the Nigerian dream? What is the Nigerian dream? It is to get out of Nigeria. Get me out of here. I'm dreaming the dream. What if God calls you back? You see, those two dreams, they aren't the kingdom dream. I put before you, we have a millennial mindset when it comes to dreams. Because we are so used to democracy. We don't really understand a kingdom. We don't understand what it means to have a supreme authority over us. What do I want to do in life? Who told you that? Who told you that you get to choose what you want to do in life? That's millennial thinking. God knows what you're going to do in life. What you're going to do in life is what King Jesus wants you to do in life. It is not the democracy of God, it is the kingdom of God. Some people want to send themselves out. Send me! Send me to Italy! Send me to Germany! Send me! Just take me out of here! God says, no. You gotta stay. Because if you can't bloom where you're planted, how are you gonna bloom when you're uprooted? You don't send yourself out, the Holy Spirit sends you out. Some of us blend together with the wall. When I talk a mission team comes up, where's disciple so-and-so? I thought they were from there. Don't nationals go home? You don't want to go. God says, go. Some of us have outstayed our visit to London. So when King Nebuchadnezzar heard about the dream, he was super inspired to learn more about God, right? Wrong. Daniel chapter 3. And it says, Daniel 3 verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The Hebrew word that is being used here means idolatrous figure. And that is actually the same word that is being used for statue in Daniel 2. So he sets up this huge statue, 27 meters high. That's 90 feet if you're metrically challenged, amen. And he thought, I am the head of gold. So why not make the whole thing gold? Why not make it all about me? You see... He had the kingdom dream, but he made it about himself. Have you made the kingdom dream to be about you? This isn't about you. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom filling the whole earth. So what is standing between you and you filling the whole earth with the gospel of Christ? You. You are standing in your own way. Check out Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. It says in verse 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone... Recognize that. The builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And given to a people who will produce its fruits. Anyone who falls on a stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls 
will be crushed. So both the word for stone here in Matthew 21 and the word in Daniel 2, the rock, the struck, the statue, they're used in the Bible as stones for building. One and the same thing. And Jesus is saying that if you fall on a stone, you will be broken to pieces. But anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. And that means pulverized. You see, the first of those two is voluntary. The other one is not. So if you're willingly, deliberately, going to fall on Christ, yes, you will crush your dream. Yes, you will fall into pieces. But then God can pick those pieces together. And put them together in the way that he wants it to be. And the Holy Spirit, the power of God, is going to be shining through the cracks. If you choose to not fall on the stone and get broken, it will fall on you. And there's not going to be anything left to put together. What is it going to be? Broken or pulverized? I'm so proud of the individuals who have chosen to crush their dreams for the kingdom dream. I think of the hearts, Michael and Maria Hart, because they gave up their lives in Curaçao, a very comfortable life. They actually had housemates, okay, doing the cleaning, doing everything for them. So they left all of that behind to come to Paradise, London. I think of our sister Val, who came here to London. And she goes, I don't care about the six-figure job. I want to serve as an intern in the church. Because I have a dream. And she actually wants to go to Spain, or wherever God wants to send her, to serve God there. That is an amazing example. I think of Michael and Michelle. And of course, they sold their house, sold their cars, to raise funds to come from the U.S. to plant a church in London, England. And it had always been Michael's dream to have his own house. So he crushed his dream to live out the kingdom dream. So you see that the kingdom dream is built on crushed dreams. What is the, what is the result of that? You are the European world sector. So the question is, have you crushed your dreams for the sake of living out the kingdom dream? What will you need to crush in your own life to build up God's kingdom? Crush those things no matter what it is. Crush your pride. Crush your mediocrity. Fruitlessness. The sin that has been holding you back. Because when you do, you can embrace the kingdom dream. My second point is, live out the kingdom dream. <laughs> because now that you have embraced the kingdom dream, now it's time to live it out. And we have heard a lot of preaching this week, have we not? And we go, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. Wow, this is incredible. We have been talking about dreaming a lot now. Now, what are you going to do? Because a dream without a plan is fantasy. Proverbs 12, 11 says, those who, have, who, those who chase fantasies have no sense. So again, you don't want to live in a fantasy world. For the Stockholm Mission team, we're packing our bags. On Wednesday, we're out of here. That's what we're going to do. Just to share my, my journey here, uh, I consider myself one of the weakest people to become a disciple. If you're visiting us tonight and you're thinking, can I actually do this? Can I actually be a disciple? 
Can I lead? Can I do this? You definitely can. For me, I was bullied in secondary school. I gave in to depression, thought about suicide. I was so insecure, I wouldn't even have come to a Bible study on my own. I was drunk when my friend invited me to study the Bible. And when he mentioned Christianity to me, I laughed. I was living in deep sin, addicted to pornography and masturbation, involving women, men, animals, very warped things. And I was a complete pagan. I only stepped into a church building a few times in my life and not for God. So when I came to the Bible studies, they thought my friend was the open one and I was the negative one holding my friend back. But through the mercy of God, I became a disciple. And I was baptized into a remnant group of seven disciples. So really it wasn't so much about the church, but I wanted to have a relationship with God. The point being, if I could become a disciple, you can become a disciple. You can do it. And then after I had become a disciple, I wasn't the guy you would look at and say, wow, this guy's gonna be ministry. I mean, he used to have long hair. I had my leather pants, cowboy boots. I had a billiard skew on one, one shoulder, guitar case on the other, ready to play and play some more. But it went well, we don't really have anybody, so we gotta work with what we have, man. When Ash and I came to London in the beginning of 2020, we were hurting in our faith. You know, some people become disciples, get married in a few years, they're sent out, they do awesome. I'm so inspired by Tommy and Vienna. <laughs> they have been disciples for six years, they're planning the second church now. Not me, though. <laughs> because I've been around for 15 years almost. And if I'm honest, I've actually needed those years to become something that even resembles something that is worthy of imitation. So in Stockholm, Ashley and I, we had been in a weak situation for years. In 2018, Ashley and I went into the full-time ministry. The church was barely 20 disciples, around 20 disciples at that point. Uh, and we were under leadership that was becoming increasingly critical against the movement and its leaders. And we had a better, a more mature way of going about things. There were talks of the movement crashing. And the environment was becoming more and more toxic. So ultimately, we grew into an island within the movement and ultimately stopped being the kingdom of God. And I just became conflicted and I didn't know where I myself stood. My faith was very low. And so things culminated when my then parents in the faith fell away in 2018 and were disfellowshipped due to divisiveness and rightly so. But much of what I had known got turned upside down. Ash and I were left to deal with the aftermath of the divisiveness, the toxic environment. And I myself gave in to discouragement and started doubting the call of God. I mean, a few months into church leadership, my parents in the faith had fallen away. The church is hurting. Things are toxic. Is this really what I want to do? Is that what leading the church is all about? I would find myself preaching a Sunday sermon and go away discouraged. At the lack of change I was seeing 
ultimately a reflection of my own leadership. Go home, grab a beer, now I'm out. It's too much to deal with. The few we baptized, they fell away. And so at the Eurasian Missions Conference, I told Kip, I thought about quitting the ministry. Now, Kip, he had to put it in a sermon right away. <laughs> Things got so bad that Casper even thought about quitting the ministry. <laughs> and Kip, he preached about the clouds coming, which is thousands upon thousands of disciples from Stockholm. And I was just crying like a baby. Because I just couldn't see. Because I had lost the kingdom dream. So when, after that, we came under the skillful leadership of Michael and Michelle. So for most of the time, the church was stagnant around 15 disciples. And I remember keep coming and asking in uh, uh, Moscow, so have you considered going to London for a while? I really had not considered that. <laughs> Sometime later, Kip was going through Stockholm to Helsinki. So how would you feel about going to London? But by that point, I started seeing the need more so. And then, of course, Michael and Michelle came to Stockholm, and the decision was made for us to move. And really, the time in London has been the best time in my discipleship. <laughs> Ashley and I are so grateful for Michael and Michelle, just for being the parents in the faith that we needed. I never knew I needed an African-American dad and an Asian mom, amen? <laughs> but Michael is a spiritual tank and sets an example that is worthy of imitation. Um, and I'm super grateful, Michael. You believed in me when I, I didn't believe in myself. And you saw greatness in me that I just couldn't see. You persevered with me when I didn't deserve it. So I'm, I'm behind your heart and soul. I'll take a bullet for you, bro. To the very end, bro. Now Michelle, she's mom. <laughs> so Michael disciples me, and then Michelle shares, and I just broke down crying. <laughs> After one or two sentences. Just to dig through all of the layers and calluses in my heart. And Ash and I, we just want to lift up your arms as we evangelize Europe in our lifetime. So God has used them to help us Get back to health, to nurture us back to faith, and for us to become dreamers again. I got nicknames in London. <laughs> After a staff, we talked about marriage and said, like, in a marriage, you got to be like Casanova. And then they said, Casper Nova. And all the brothers were just hysterically laughing at me. Now, I wasn't laughing. I was ticked off. And then later on, I'm like, why am I so ticked off? That's who I should be in the context of my marriage, amen? And we have this principle that what happens in Lion's Den stays at Lion's Den. But it didn't. It leaked out. <laughs> so we have been able to grow in our marriage, amen? My second nickname was Caspartan. I'm like, yeah, that's a manly name. That's a lot better. But really the biggest lesson has been just walking with God. Because I was appointed evangelist in Moscow 2007. I became an evangelist in London 2020 to 2022. I'm so grateful for my wife Ashley. Isn't she beautiful? She's my better half. She compliments my dull sides. She's a smart one in the family, amen. And we get to dream again. We want to take the gospel back to Sweden. We want to take the gospel back to Scandinavia. We want to take the gospel back to the Baltics. We are dreaming again. We want to take that country, that area for God. We are ready for a rematch. 
Where do you need to go back for a rematch? What is something you haven't been overcoming? Something you haven't been winning over? Go back for a rematch. The fact that you're here shows you are an overcomer. Where many have given up, you haven't. You are still here and God still has a plan for you. I'm going for the South region. They have been our family here in London. And you have enabled us to do well and to heal and just to do great things for God. And I'm proud for the South for sending out most mission teams in the London church, amen? And you will do even greater things under Dom and Rachel. I'm grateful for Eric and Michelle for holding down the fort in Stockholm and for all of the Stockholm disciples. You are overcomers. So for us as the Stockholm mission team, we are living out the kingdom dream. God wants us to be overcomers. If you have lost the kingdom dream, start dreaming again. Where you have failed, dare to dream again. Because failure is not final. The kingdom dream is built on crushed dreams. So crush your dreams for the sake of the kingdom dream. Live out the kingdom dream which will fill the whole earth with the kingdom of God. Thank you and to God be all the glory.